Well, thank you very much for that reception and that very kind and generous deliverance. Though it all, it really points out to folks in the audience is they've got another old guy <laughs> with a set of remarks to go through before we get to the real event. I tried to remember who spoke at my different graduations and as you might imagine, I failed to remember or have any idea who spoke. <laughs> I do remember the family members and loved ones that were in attendance. And I remember my commissioning as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. But after that, there's not much. So with that in mind, I will do my level best this morning to follow my own three cardinal rules for public speaking. Enunciate, be brief, and be seated. <laughs> Distinguished faculty, staff, parents, family, and most importantly, you the graduates. I am humbled and honored to be asked to be your graduation speaker. There are a few moments more exciting than a college graduation, and perhaps none that more clearly symbolize the strength of our great nation, our confidence in its future, and the wealth of our society. I served in the military for over 38 years as an intelligence officer, and except for a few days of testifying on Capitol Hill, I wouldn't trade a single day of it. <laughs> It's been a wonderful life of public service, exciting, challenging, fascinating, and I would argue necessary. It's appropriate, I think, for me at this phase of my life to be standing here in front of you. As a young officer in the military, I always said that for any commander or senior leader, the two most important people that that person need to have, need to have with them on their left and their right were their operations officer and their intelligence officer. As I got to be more senior and with stars on my shoulder, that changed to my general counsel and my IG. <laughs> now, I've got over 250 of you. <laughs> Things seem to have gone full circle. Early on in an intelligence career, we learn a very valuable lesson. There are only really four outcomes to any crisis or situation. You can have a policy success, a diplomatic success, an operational success, or an intelligence failure. The successes we enjoyed in the intelligence community were many and are never talked about. And that's actually the way it should be. But let the intelligence community make a mistake and everybody and their brother knows about it. It's not right. It's not wrong, it's just the way it is. There are a lot of reasons why we have intelligence failures and I'm not going to stand up here and lecture you on why that is today. That is not the purpose for me being here. The world that I and others in this audience grew up in is a lot different than the world this class will find itself in. The world that you face today is a very complex security environment marked by a broad spectrum of dissimilar threats, including rising regional powers and highly adaptive and resilient transnational terrorist networks. It is much less predictable in terms of outcomes, given the uneven demographic and economic growth that is occurring even as we move closer and closer to globalization. Technology proliferation and increased competition for resources are here to stay. For all of the challenges we face in this world, about which we read and hear about every day, let me note that you, the 2017 graduates of the Stetson University College of Law, are entering an era of global interdependence that is full of promise and opportunity. I said that I thought the world was changing and that the world was different. Your generation will need to adapt to that change 
and to that transition. I think former GE chairman Jack Welch got it right when he said, when the rate of change outside is faster than the rate of change inside, the end is near. Will Rogers actually summed it up better by saying, even if you're on the right track, you'll be run over if you just sit there. It's important to not only recognize that things are changing around us, but I think it is more important to understand the change that is taking place. I think that is particularly true for you graduates today entering the legal profession. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I am talking about. Let's look at two basic components of our society, population and the information revolution. Now, I'm not the oldest guy on the stage up here. Not sure what that says, but, <laughs> but about the time that I was born, the world's population was 3.4 billion. In 2000, the world's population was 6.1 billion. By 2020, it is estimated to be 7.6 billion, and by 20, 20, 2030, it may be close to 8.3 billion. Now, as I said, it's important to understand those numbers. Because at the end of the day, that's all they are. They're just numbers. But if we look at where the birth rates are increasing and where they're declining, we start to understand the global impact that comes from that. Asia and Africa will account for most of that population growth. The youngest countries, that is those countries where the under 30 age group represents 60% of the population, will be in sub-Saharan Africa. So what does that mean to us as a nation? Should it concern us that there will be lack of arable land and that access to food, water, and energy will be at risk? Will unstable governments struggling to provide for their people still be the norm? Will resource competition still drive social unrest? And what about the information revolution? We live in an age where information is instantaneous. Just thinking to a few years after I graduated from Auburn, was when we had the first 24 by 7 news network. IBM's PC was still under development, and a mobile phone network was in its basic infancy. Fast forward to 2005. Facebook did not exist for most. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was in the sky. 4G was a parking place. Applications went to colleges and universities, and LinkedIn was a prison. <laughs> Today, we have bad actors utilizing social media to advance their causes. Terrorist groups have their own web page, their own webmaster, and protocols for entering the website. At least 214 terrorists are using Twitter, and one has over 70,000 followers. By 2020, the number of internet users or whatever replaces the internet of today is expected to double to over 4 billion users. So again, what does that mean to us? Technology in the cloud will provide the crowd with a voice. Ones and zeros on computers will become weapons as they already have to hack, steal, and destroy other informational systems. So what does all of this mean to you, the class of 2017? Now, my generation is being told that you're the best educated, you're the most technically literate of any generation of Americans, you know no limits, you feel like you're entitled to everything, <laughs> you're highly creative and technologically advanced, you believe anything and everything is possible, you crave teamwork, you crave fun, and you demand social relationships with everyone. So, what should you do? Well, I believe you should seize this moment. This is your time, but don't forget those that have gone before you blazing the trail, setting the standard, and ensuring that the opportunity would be there for you. Don't forget those that will follow after you and the fact that others helped you get to where you are today and never forget that in the future. Let me urge you to always remember the hope, 
and optimism that you feel right now. Never let it go. The more you draw on the excitement of this moment, the more energy you will have to overcome the challenges that lie ahead, and the greater the contributions you will make to your country and to the world. People often ask my thoughts on what it takes to be successful or what are the secrets to good leadership. Now, I don't believe that I've got any great revelations. I've always said I'm living proof the Lord has a sense of humor. <laughs> but as any young good staff officer, I have an elevator speech about that that I can encapsulate in three thoughts. Now this is clearly a Cliff Notes version and I'm not even sure that any of y'all have any idea what I'm talking about when I say Cliff Notes. But it's the only way I made it through American and British Lit many years ago. First, as Clint Eastwood made famous in his Dirty Harry movies, a good man, or to be right in this world we live in today, a good man or a good woman has got to know his or her limitations. Know yourself. Know and understand, understand your strengths and weaknesses. Be sure enough of yourself to seek outside opinions and advice on those strengths and weaknesses. Adapt them or learn ways to mitigate them when necessary. Second, I think our character defines us. Our character determines whether ours will be lives well lived or not. Character is defined as the stable and distinctive qualities built into an individual's life which determines his or her response regardless of circumstances. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, character is higher than intellect. I could not agree more with Mr. Emerson. This school has helped you develop your intellect and I hope it has also helped to continue to refine and mold or develop your character in a positive way. One of my favorite sayings is that you measure a person's character by how they act when no one is watching and by the choices they make when they believe no one will ever know. But you will know, and at the end of the day, you should measure yourself against your own standards. Set those standards high. Never settle. Be the standard against whom all others are measured, and I guarantee you will be a success in life. Third, practice the golden rule every day. Treat others as you would want to be treated. Over my time in the U.S. government, I was introduced to a lot of different technologies. A lot of them are still secret. If there's one thing that I learned over many years, it's that the greatest asset that any organization has are its people. They are the greatest resource. They are the key to any success. I used to say that I like to put the personal in personnel. How you treat and interact with others says a lot about you as a person and as an individual and as a representative of this law school. So I want to offer my sincerest congratulations to you all, the graduates, for your achievements and for what about you are about to embark upon as you begin this next phase of life. Also, make a difference. You have been given something and you have earned something that is immeasurable. Don't waste it. As you join the more than 9,000 graduates from Stetson who have gone before you, be proud of your accomplishments. But never forget what it took to get you to this place and those that helped you get here. Again, congratulations, Godspeed, Thank you for listening to me today, though you didn't have much choice. <laughs> May God continue to bless you, Stetson University, and the United States of America.